In the summer of 1981, tragedy struck a family and a nation was left in shock. It was a typical day at the Hollywood Mall, Florida, until six-year-old Adam Walsh innocently wandered away from his mother's sight in a bustling Sears department store. Two weeks later, the unthinkable became a grim reality as Adam's civet head was found in a remote drainage canal, sending waves of horror across the nation. His untimely death captured the hearts of millions and sparked a quest for justice that would define a father's mission. John Walsh, Adam's father, transformed his grief into a relentless pursuit of justice, becoming a beacon of hope for victims of violent crimes. His dedication led to groundbreaking television programs, shedding light on unsolved cases and bringing criminals to justice. But amidst the pursuit of answers, one question remains hauntingly unanswered. On the morning of July 27, 1981, in Hollywood, Florida, Adam joined his mother, Reve Drew, for a shopping trip at the Hollywood Mall, now rebranded as Hollywood Hills Plaza. Navigating through the bustling corridors, they made their way to Sears, entering through the Northern Gateway. Passing by the catalogue department, Adam was captivated by a glowing display of Atari 2600 video games at a nearby kiosk in the toy department. Several other boys were equally engrossed in the gaming frenzy. Persuading Reve to let him stay, Adam was granted the freedom to explore the nearby toy department while she ventured off to the lighting department. She informed him that she would return in 10 minutes, naturally drawn to the excitement. Adam joined the group of boys, eagerly taking turns at the games. Meanwhile, Reve inquired about a discounted lamp with a Sears employee. Upon her return, Reve discovered Adam missing along with the other boys. It later emerged that an altercation had occurred over gaming privileges, prompting a security guard to intervene and instruct the boys to leave. Adam's reserved nature likely hindered him from clarifying his situation to the guard, resulting in him being swept along with the group and ushered out through the Sears West entrance. Inside the store, Reve frantically searched for her son, scouring every corner including the toy department, where Adam was nowhere to be found. Desperate, she initiated a store-wide announcement, pleading for Adam's return to the toy department. Through the booming speakers echoed the plea, Adam Walsh, go to the nearest salesperson so you can find your way back to your mother. Your mother is waiting for you, Adam. During her search, she coincidentally encountered her mother-in-law, Jean, who happened to be shopping at Sears as well. Initially assuming Adam was with her, she quickly learned he wasn't. Without hesitation, Jean promptly joined the search effort. Despite over 90 minutes of extensive searching and paging, Adam remained untraceable. Eventually, at 1.55pm, Reve made the difficult decision to contact the Hollywood police, seeking urgent assistance in locating her missing son. Despite the police response from the Hollywood police and thorough searches of the toy department, the entire Sears store and all areas of the Hollywood Mall and its vicinity, Adam could not be found. Law enforcement conducted an extensive search throughout South Florida, distributing photos and flyers over the following weeks. 16 days after Adam's disappearance on Monday, August 10th, at approximately 6.45 p.m., fishermen Robert Hughes and Vernon Bailey made a chilling discovery in a canal near mile marker 130 of Florida's Turnpike in Indian River County. They found the severed head of a young boy, 120 miles, 32 kilometers, away from the store where Adam was last seen. Despite a thorough investigation, no other remains or physical evidence were found in the area, leading investigators to question whether it was the actual site of the homicide. The Hollywood Police Department swiftly relayed this discovery to Adam's father, John Walsh, although caution was exercised regarding the identification, prompting a request for dental records to be confirmed. The following morning, August 11th, John and Reve Walsh appeared on national television, expressing their ongoing hope for Adam's safe return. A reward of $100,000 was offered for any information leading to his recovery. At Indian River County Hospital, 
a family friend, John Monaghan, positively identified the severed head as Adam Walsh's, a confirmation later substantiated by dental records. Later that afternoon, Dr. Ronald Wright from the Broward County Medical Examiner's Office conducted an examination at the Fort Lauderdale Medical Examiner's Facility. Dr. Wright determined that Adam's cause of death was asphyxiation. Additionally, he noted that Adam had suffered facial injuries, including blows to the face resulting in a fractured nose. Dr. Wright's examination further revealed significant findings, indicating that Adam had been deceased for approximately 10 days or more before being discovered. These findings included liquefied brain matter and evidence of five distinct blows from a sharp-bladed instrument confirming the tragic circumstances of Adam's death post-mortem. On the same day, the Hollywood Police Department Detective Division transitioned from searching for a missing child to initiating a murder investigation concerning Adam Walsh. The investigation commenced with interviews with individuals closely associated with Adam, including his immediate family and close family friends. Furthermore, neither John nor Reve Walsh provided detectives with information suggesting a motive for someone to abduct or harm their son. Initially, Detectives harbored suspicions about their house guest, Jim Campbell, and his relationship with Adam. Campbell underwent multiple interviews and was asked to undergo two polygraph tests. Detectives also investigated Michael Monaghan, a family friend who had assaulted another boy with a machete shortly after Adam's disappearance. However, despite extensive background checks on these individuals, no substantial information emerged to link anyone to the case. Amidst the ongoing investigation, suspicions arose regarding Edward James, 50, of Pompano Beach, Florida, who was arrested on November 17, 1981, by Pompano Beach police for abducting a boy, prompting Hollywood detectives to investigate him in connection with the Walsh case. John Terry, 55, from Johnson City, Tennessee, shared a cell with James in Broward County Jail from November 22nd to 23rd. Terry, arrested by Deerfield Beach Police, revealed James discussed abducting a boy from Pompano Beach and enticing a child from a Hollywood department store, detailing taking the child to an ice cream parlor before severing his head at a canal. Although James didn't disclose all the details, he hinted at disposing of other remains in Stewart, Florida. James expressed confidence detectives wouldn't find blood in his 1973 Brown Plymouth Fury and initially kept the victim's clothing under the car seat before removing it as the investigation intensified. Detectives discovered James was absent from his Pompano Beach apartment for two weeks in the summer of 1981. They also found he had a seat cover installed in his car on August 27th, prompting a second search warrant to retrieve the vehicle from Driscoll's towing service the car underwent careful processing at the Broward County Medical Examiner's Office, focusing on the newly installed seat cover. James claimed he was working at Ted Kranz Construction Company in Plantation, Florida, on July 27th and learned about the Adam Walsh case solely from the news media. However, John Terry reported that James admitted lying to investigators after their conversation on October 18th. Hollywood detectives continued their investigation interviewing James again on November 11, 1995. His tape statement, analyzed for deception, showed no signs of dishonesty. When challenged with Terry's claims, James denied confessing to Adam Walsh's murder, dismissing Terry as unreliable due to alleged alcoholism. Despite unsuccessful attempts to contact Terry later and lacking evidence or credible statements against James, detectives determined the investigation should continue unless new information arises. On October 11, 1983, a significant development emerged in the Walsh case, linking it to Otis Elwood Tool, a 36-year-old Jacksonville resident who was incarcerated in Duval County, Florida, on pending charges in relation to an arson homicide. At approximately 9 a.m., the day prior, Detective Steve Kindrick of the Brevard County Sheriff's Department Homicide Unit called Hollywood detectives to inform them that Toole had confessed to his involvement in the abduction and murder of a boy aged 6 to 10 from a Sears Mall in the Fort Lauderdale area several years earlier. 
to verify this claim, Hollywood detectives contacted Detective Jesse W. Terry of the Jacksonville Police Department, who was investigating a homicide involving Toole and Henry Lee Lucas. Lucas had previously been imprisoned for the murder of Toole's niece, Frida Powell, in Denton, Texas, in 1982. Detective Terry provided confirmation of this connection. Armed with this new information, Hollywood detectives promptly traveled to Jacksonville to conduct further questioning of Tool. On October 19, 1983, Tool disclosed to detectives his intention to confess to the crime in order to find closure. While he offered a detailed account of the incident, inconsistencies were evident in his recollection. Tool portrayed the victim as aged between seven and 10, with blonde curly hair, dressed in blue jeans, a blue shirt and sneakers. However, according to Reve Walsh, the victim, Adam, was six years old with sandy brown hair and he was last seen wearing green shorts, a red and white striped Izod pullover shirt and yellow rubber thongs. During his statement, Tool recounted picking up Walsh from a Sears Mall parking lot where he claimed Walsh willingly entered his vehicle after being offered candy and toys. However, Walsh later expressed a desire to return home and began crying. Tool admitted to striking Walsh in the face when he continued to cry and then proceeded to assault him further, causing him to lose consciousness. Tool confessed to driving to a rural area where he decapitated Walsh with a machete. He admitted to keeping Walsh's head in his possession for several days before disposing of it in a nearby canal. In an alternate rendition of events, Tool accused Lucas of being involved, claiming that Lucas forcefully took the child into the vehicle, used a bayonet to decapitate the child's head, and performed sex acts on the severed head. Subsequent investigations revealed that Lucas was incarcerated in a Maryland state jail on July 27, 1981, following his arrest by the Maryland State Police in Pikesville, Maryland, on July 22. He remained in custody until his release on October 7. These notable contradictions in Tool's testimony prompted detectives to question the credibility of his account, which underwent frequent changes in the years that followed. When informed of Lucas's custody status on the day of Adam Walsh's abduction, Tool later confessed in a subsequent statement that day that he acted alone and falsely accused Lucas out of a desire for revenge. Tool provided numerous admissions regarding the murder of Adam Walsh, with one particularly striking instance captured on video during an interview with a Texas Ranger in 1984. The Ranger probes Tool about his extensive history of killings alongside his partner, Henry Lee Lucas. Have you ever regretted killing someone? The Ranger inquired. I do feel remorseful about that Adam Walsh boy, Tool responded. He's the only one. He was just six years old. Despite his frequent confessions, Tool often retracted his statements shortly after making them. On October 21, 1983, Investigators transported Tool to Hollywood to pinpoint the site of the abduction and the spot where he claimed to have disposed of the victim's head along Florida's turnpike. Tool initially expressed confidence in identifying the mall where the abduction occurred. Detectives tested his accuracy by taking him to a different mall first, but Tool confirmed it was not the correct one. When they arrived at Hollywood Mall, Tool found it familiar but couldn't definitively confirm it. Later that day, he led detectives to the turnpike entrance and eventually to a dirt road where he claimed to have buried the victim. This revelation was significant as no one had prior knowledge of this location and Toole had mentioned it during a previous interview in Jacksonville, attributing his lack of recollection to intoxication. Subsequently, Toole was returned to Jacksonville while detectives continued their investigation. On October 26, Hollywood detectives returned to Jacksonville to obtain another statement from Tool. During the session, he expressed uncertainty about his involvement in Adam Walsh's murder. Initially denying any role, Tool later confessed to the abduction and murder, attributing his earlier denial to confusion. Despite contradictory statements, detectives continued their investigation. Tool sought medical treatment in Newport News, Virginia on July 22, 1981, and arrived in Jacksonville two days before Adam Walsh's abduction. 
police confirmed his presence in Jacksonville on July 24 and July 31, but could not verify his whereabouts on July 27, the day Adam disappeared. Toole initially claimed to have buried the victim in South Florida, but later recanted, stating he disposed of the body in Jacksonville at his mother's burnt homestead, using an old refrigerator as an incinerator. Law enforcement authorities seized a 1971 Cadillac from a pre-owned car dealership located in Jacksonville. The vehicle, a black over white four-door model, corresponds precisely to the one implicated in the incident described by Toole. An investigation revealed that the car was registered under the name of an employee at a roofing company in Jacksonville, where Toole also worked. The employee informed detectives that she had sold the car to the dealership after Tool defaulted on the agreed-upon payments. Blood was found on the carpeted floorboards in Tool's 1971 Cadillac, along with what many believed to be an outline of Adam Walsh's face, which corroborated his statement about placing Adam Walsh's head in the car. However, DNA testing on the vehicle's samples in 1995 was not possible, as they couldn't conclusively determine it was Adams due to the absence of both the carpeting and the car. Inside the vehicle, investigators found a machete, which matched the description provided by Toole, although its connection to him remained uncertain. Despite retracting his confessions, Toole remains a focus of the investigation due to the specificity of some of his statements. Although detectives lack conclusive evidence to exclude or implicate him definitively, in 1988, Tool resurfaced in the case, admitting to Adam's murder in letters sent to various publications. That same year, he also attempted extortion by sending a letter to John Walsh, claiming he knew the whereabouts of Adam's remains and demanding $50,000 for the information. John Walsh promptly alerted the authorities upon receiving the letter, yet no further action ensued. However, detectives from the Broward County Sheriff's Office discovered inconsistencies in Toole's confessions. During this period, he was admitting to numerous murder cases across the country, all with vague details. Investigators also expressed concerns that he might have learnt about the Walsh case from a movie air just two weeks before his initial confession. Moreover, despite ongoing doubts about Toole's credibility, investigators from Broward revealed a concerning pattern involving Jesse Terry, a detective from Jacksonville, Terry, who claimed to have heard Toole's initial confession, was found to have engaged in similar behaviour five years prior. This involved divulging confidential information about the Walsh case to Toole, thereby initiating a series of confessions and retractions. The memo further disclosed that Terry had struck a deal with Toole regarding the rights to his story for a book and movie. Subsequently, Terry was removed from the homicide squad when this arrangement came to light. Despite ongoing doubts about Toole's credibility, investigations have repeatedly implicated him in the case. In both 1991 and 1995, Toole again denied involvement in Adam's murder, claiming he fabricated the confession to gain privileges such as trips out of prison, food and cigarettes. Detectives pursued multiple leads to validate Otis Toole's inconsistent accounts and interviewed inmates and cellmates associated with him. Through these interviews, they uncovered discussions implicating Toole in several killings, none of which were connected to Adam Walsh. Continuing their investigation, detectives interviewed individuals in July 1995 who had interacted with Toole. One man alleged that Toole confessed to killing Adam Walsh, displaying emotional involvement during the discussion. Although he withheld certain details initially, he later hinted at possessing more undisclosed knowledge during a subsequent interview on September 19, 1995. The detectives remained uncertain about the accuracy of his claims, but remained committed to pursuing truthful statements. On September 19, 1995, investigators interviewed an individual who had previously corresponded with Hollywood detectives regarding the Walsh case. This person alleged that Toole and Henry Lucas abducted, sexually assaulted, and dismembered the victim, disposing of the remains in a waterway. Another lead emerged when Arlene Mayer of Hollywood reported an encounter with Toole at a Kmart department store in July 1981. Mayer and her daughter, Heidi identified Toole from a lineup of photographs after he tried to coax Heidi into a shopping cart. 
Another tip came in August 1990, one from William Missler, who witnessed Toole luring a boy he believed to be Adam Walsh into a Cadillac near Sears on the day of the abduction. Missler's account, corroborated under hypnosis, provided specific details consistent with Toole's description of the car he used during the abduction and murder. Following nearly 13 years of incarceration for an unrelated murder, Otis Toole passed away in prison at the age of 49 in 1996. In a deathbed confession, Toole admitted to his niece that he was responsible for Adam's murder. The niece later relayed this revelation to John Walsh. His death brought immense disappointment to Adam Walsh's family, who had hoped for Toole to face trial for the young boy's killing. John Walsh, Adam's father, remained resolute in his belief that Toole was responsible for his son's tragic death. In the aftermath of Adam Walsh's murder, John Walsh openly criticized the handling of the case by the Hollywood police. In 1997, he published his book, Tears of Rage, wherein he condemned the investigation, describing it as marred by what he deemed to be the worst of the seven deadly sins laziness, arrogance, and pride. Walsh lamented the shortcomings of the local police agency, highlighting their limited resources and lack of experience in managing a search of such magnitude. He expressed his growing concerns about the chaotic and disorganized nature of the investigation. One notable error among many was the misplacement of the bloodstained carpet from Tool's vehicle, followed by the loss of the car itself. Additionally, he stated that police discovered a pair of light green boy's shorts and one yellow flip-flop in the Tool's mother's burnt homestead during a search, matching the clothing Adam was last seen wearing. However, these items were not shown to the Walsh family for identification, remaining in evidence for years unknown to John or Reve. In 2006, a seasoned investigator Joe Matthews, hired by the Walsh family, uncovered them and presented them to the Walsh parents, only to discover they did not belong to Adam. Similarly, police considered the possibility that the notorious serial killer, Jeffrey Dahmer, might have been involved in Adam's abduction as he was residing in Florida at the time. Dahmer gained infamy for his arrest in Wisconsin in 1991, following the murders of multiple men and boys characterized by gruesome methods, including decapitation. At the time of Adam's murder, Dahmer resided in Miami Beach, where two eyewitnesses placed him at the mall on the day of the abduction. One witness reported seeing a suspicious individual entering the toy department, while another witnessed a young blonde man with a distinctive chin throwing a struggling child into a blue van and speeding away. Both witnesses identified the man as Dama after his arrest, prompted by images circulated in newspapers. Reports also indicated that Dama worked at a delivery shop with access to a blue van during that period. Former FBI agent Neil Patel alleges that Jeffrey Dama was responsible for the abduction and murder of six-year-old Adam Walsh in 1981. Patel asserts that upon arriving at Dama's Milwaukee apartment on July 22, 1991, shortly after his arrest, he and a local detective shared a moment of recognition, silently acknowledging the potential connection to Adam's case due to similarities observed at the scene. When I arrived on the gruesome scene with the local detective, we both looked at each other and whispered, Adam, Patel said. Following Dama's conviction for the killings of 17 men and boys, Patel visited him at Wisconsin's Columbia State Prison. During their conversation, Patel confronted Dama about Adam's murder. Patel interpreted Dama's response as a tacit acknowledgement of guilt. He said if he did admit to it, he would be killed in prison as a pedophile, Patel said. My impression was that he was admitting he did it. During a 1992 interview regarding Adam Walsh, Dama consistently denied involvement, pointing to his exhaustive confessions about his previous crimes. I've told you everything, how I killed them, how I cooked them, who I ate. Why wouldn't I tell you if I did it to someone else? Subsequently, John Walsh refuted any connection between Adam's abduction and Dama's previous crimes, citing a lack of evidence. In the aftermath of Adam's tragic passing, his father, John Walsh, took over as the host of America's Most Wanted from 1988 to 2012, 
a show renowned for its role in apprehending over 1,000 criminals. Additionally, on July 27, 2006, marking the 25th anniversary of Adam Walsh's disappearance, US President George W. Bush signed the Adam Walsh Child Protection and Safety Act into law. This pivotal legislation established a national database of convicted child sex offenders and imposed harsher federal penalties for crimes against children. Following persistent advocacy from the Walsh family in 2006, the case underwent a reopening. John Walsh recounted to NBC in 2011 how his wife, Rive, urged him to take action, emphasizing their track record of solving crimes on America's most wanted. Recognizing the need for renewed effort, John acknowledged Rive's insistence and identified a detective whom he trusted to assist them. This detective was Joe Matthews, a seasoned investigator from Miami Beach. Matthews played a pivotal role as he became the first person to review 98 previously undeveloped photos of Otis Toole's Cadillac. Among these images, Matthews made a crucial observation, a bloodstain resembling Adam Walsh's face imprinted on the carpet. In describing the discovery, Matthews highlighted the significance of the blood transfer, marking a breakthrough in the case. While John Walsh remained convinced, some experts expressed skepticism. A reporter from the Broward Palm Beach New Times even questioned whether the outline truly depicted Adam, or if it was akin to seeing patterns in random shapes. In December 2008, authorities officially closed Adam's murder case, citing the evidence against Toole as definitive proof of his culpability in the tragic death of the six-year-old boy. While Adam's murderer was identified, the rest of his body was never found. While nothing can change the course of Adam Walsh's life, his legacy remains deeply ingrained in the collective consciousness. His family's relentless advocacy has catalyzed significant strides in child protection and has undoubtedly safeguarded countless children, ensuring a safer future for generations to come. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and share. Let us know in the comments if there are any true crimes or unsolved mysteries you'd like us to explore. And as always, stay safe out there. Until next time,